think we'll get started here. Welcome to UND Aerospace's Career Series. Today we get to hear from Boy and Sitsu regarding UAS career pathways. Um, since uh, over a decade, we've been working with um, Boy and Sitsu, and we've started out using the Scan Eagle for research projects, doing some work with the Air Force Research Lab, and have developed that relationship over the years, and it's grown. And in 2020, we added three more Scan Eagles to our fleet to make it five Scan Eagles. And we are now, um, in, we have now included the Scan Eagle into our curriculum. So every UAS student who's in the UAS degree program gets the opportunity to fly the Scan Eagle within our curriculum. So we are very excited uh, to have uh, Boeing and Sitsu here to talk to us about the career pathways that are out there. Uh, before we get started, just a quick overview of how questions will be done. Uh, you, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A function that will enable you to ask questions. Um, the panelists will be looking at that and answering questions as they are uh, able to as they give their presentation. But don't worry if your question wasn't reached. Uh, we will have a time at the end. We'll, we'll be able to review those questions and uh, answer the ones that we can with the time that's remaining. And so thank you all for coming. And most of all, thank you, um, Boyan Sitsu, for coming here and, and, and being able to speak with us. I have uh, three distinguished guests with us. I have Ali Fattis, who is the uh, VP of Flight Operations, and Jim Dalton, who is a UAS mishap investigator, and Tyler Sibley, who is a US, UAS operator for Boeing and Sitzer. So thank you very much for coming, and we look forward to hearing more about you and then also the career pathways that are available for our students. So thank you. Okay, I think I'm up. Jim, can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Awesome. Next slide, please. Okay, thanks. So I'm just going to introduce myself a little bit and then allow Jim and Ty to introduce themselves as well before we get into the bulk of the presentation. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Paul, for the introduction and thanks for having us today. And I want to thank the rest of the UND team that helped to put this opportunity together for both us and for the students. Um, I'm really excited to be part of this panel. And I also wanna thank Jim and Ty, my colleagues, for helping to put together this deck. Those are the real subject matter experts on UAS. So I think you're really gonna enjoy talking to them about their experiences. So just a little bit about myself. Um, I, I got a Bachelor of Arts degree from Holy Cross in 1993. So a long time ago in a land far, far away, unrelated to aviation. Um, some people at UND have heard of the tiny little Holy Cross College because they actually, in 2006, beat the Minnesota Gophers in hockey at the Ralph in a very unexpected upset. And it was a huge deal in North Dakota that Holy Cross came into town and, and beat Minnesota. And um, I was actually um, kind of knew the whole UND team from my previous job, which I'll get into in just a moment at the time. So it was really exciting to be part of the Holy Cross family. And I still feel really connected to that big event for UND. So I, as I said, I got my bachelor's degree unrelated to aviation. And when I decided to go into aviation, I chose a flight program uh, that had, was associated with a community college. So I ended up with an associate's degree as I was pursuing all my ratings. Um, while I was working at Horizon Air, which I'll get to in just a moment, I got a master's degree um, and I CFI, CFII, MEI, and ATP. So as you can see from this slide, my, my, the bulk of my career up until a little over a year and a half ago was in commercial manned aviation at Horizon Air from December of 2000 to March of 2019. So I was hired at Horizon as a full-time pilot, first officer in the Dash 8 400. I moved into leadership positions um, about five years into my career there, started in the chief pilot's office, working for our chief pilot at the time, Lamar Halgard, a UND grad, um, who started the first direct hire program of its type. And uh, through that opportunity, I got to be very close with a lot of UND faculty on the commercial manned aviation side. I ended up flying the 175 for Horizon Air before I left. I was the FAA Part 119 Director of Operations as well as the System Chief Pilot at various stages of my career at Horizon. In 2019, the opportunity to join the in-situ team was presented to me and, you know, a lot of people don't leave manned aviation. You kind of get in there and then you stay because of seniority and because it's, you, can't, you can't argue with flying airplanes, it's a fun job. 
But this was such a neat opportunity for me to pivot my career in the same industry, but in such a different growing portion of aerospace and engineering uh, that I simply couldn't resist the opportunity. And um, 18 plus months later, I am so, so happy I made the decision that I did. And it's been uh, an amazing year and a half to get to learn the unmanned industry a little bit more. And I've been really happy to partner with UND as much as we can. This, this pandemic has put a little bit of a wrinkle into all of our plans, um, but it, it's been a great experience and I'm getting to work, uh, looking forward to getting to work with the program even more. That's all I've got. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Jim Dalton, and I am a uh, UND grad. Graduated in 2010, and my uh, major was commercial aviation. So initially, uh, my dreams were to become an airline pilot. And uh, after four years and uh, graduating, and taking some unmanned classes, uh, decided that that was not my route, um, and wanted to dive into uh, the unmanned world. I did go through um, all of my flight instructor training, CFI, II, MEI at UND. Uh, Paul Steiner actually did my MEI check ride. So quick, funny story there is, you know, I see Paul Snyder years later and uh, I said, you know, hey, um, you know, and he's obviously the, you know, director of UAS um, ops at, at UND now. And I said, hey, you did my uh, uh, MEI check ride. Do you remember? And he said, I don't, I don't really remember, but, you know, I think that's a good thing. So I said, yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah, I passed. So isn't that funny that you, you uh, sort of, you know, forget all of your successes, but you remember your failures. So um, I'm glad that that was a success story there. So, um, but uh, have a great relationship with Paul uh, these days. And I'm, I'm glad we had that, uh, that memory together. Um, so I, I got my internship at in situ in 2012 and it was a five month internship. Uh, with a mix of uh, learning about standards and evaluation at in situ and also uh, flight safety and learning about mishap investigation and all the other elements uh, within, within flight safety at in situ. And uh, that, that was a, an awesome internship because it obviously uh, turned into a full-time position uh, after, after five months where uh, I came on as a UAS mishap investigator, which I've now been in this job uh, for going on eight years now. And uh, I've worked my way up to to be more of a lead role now on the team. So um, that's uh, that's me in a nutshell. So I'll turn it over to uh, Ty. All right, um, everybody, hear me? All right. Yep. All right. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, Ty Sibley. Um, I went to UND for a year, uh, the fall of '03 and the spring of '04, um, and then. Uh, my advisor and me kind of decided that maybe UND wasn't for me, I guess is the easiest way to put that. Um, but uh, I ended up, uh, I joined the Navy uh, after UND and I did four years in the Navy. Um, uh, one thing I don't have on my little resume thing here is my manned aircraft experience. I'm a, I uh, got my private uh, right after UND. I picked up my instrument rating while I was in the Navy and I added commercial single and multi um, just a couple of years ago and I'm working on my CFI right now. Um, and then I'm flying pretty often either towing gliders here in Hood River or um, flying chase planes for, for in-situ and things like that. So um, I did finish my degree at another aeronautical university with uh, an online program, um, thanks to the GI Bill. And then uh, I joined in-situ right out of the Navy in 2009. Uh, they hired me before I was even before I was even discharged from the Navy. So um, I was hired as a field service representative, which is um, basically a UAS operator that travels, that's that's forward deployed with the military. And then um, I did two uh, tours flying uh, in the Middle East for in situ as a civilian, uh, two six month uh, rotations over there. And then I came back as a uh, pilot instructor and then from there, uh, about three years later, I ended up on the flight demonstration team for about three or four years. And then we started in situ commercial uh, for a while where we did, um, we pursued oil and gas and uh, 
uh, disaster relief, a lot of wildfire flying, things like that. I did that for a couple of years. And now I work in flight tests and just kind of flight operations in a whole where I, um, I still do all of those things. Um, pretty much everything there, um, I'm still pretty active in doing. So, so that's me. Thanks, Ty. Okay, we've got um, a kind of a corporate deck. This is a standard deck that in situ puts together for people who need to share information about in situ to audiences like this. So we are gonna walk you through this deck and then we'll uh, talk a little bit about UAS career path and then open up for questions. Okay, next slide, Jim. Okay, so this is just an overview of in situ, um, industry leading experience and reliability. So since 1994, in situ has pioneered the design, manufacturing and operation of high performance cost-effective UAS with superior payload capability. I'm gonna note that this picture, I love it. It, it's, it presents our five unmanned variants um, to see. And I love the moss on the roof on that kind of overhang outside of our production facility that just shows where we're from, which is Pacific Northwest. That's where our roots are. That's my favorite part of this picture is the moss. No, not really, it's, the, it's actually the unmanned vehicles, but it is, I love that part of it. Okay, next slide. Oh, I do want to note too, 1.3 million flight hours. You don't have to go back, Jim, but 1.3 million flight hours we have. Um, so you can see on this slide that our mission is to help the warfighter. And so we are primarily a defense contractor. Um, as Ty mentioned, he was involved in our commercial efforts, um, which with FAA airspace issues that probably you guys discuss as some part of your curriculum, there's some challenges there. Um, so, so we're not as active in that space as we were when Ty was involved in that program that we had at in situ. I do think that there's great opportunity going forward. I'm just not sure what that looks like right now. So now our mission involves helping the warfighter save law, lives, solve problems, and execute missions across the globe. As you can see, there's a list there of the types of activities that we are involved with, mostly ISR services, intelligence surveillance and recon, and all of the other things that you see mentioned there. Um, we participate in border patrol, coastal security, threat detection, and force protection. Um, when you really get into the details of what services we provide to US government forces and international military forces. It's really fascinating. Next slide. So in this slide, you can see a, a, a list. I mean, you can see that we are providing support for regions across the globe and all of these countries. The way Zoom is right now, I've got a list of faces over on the side, so I can't actually see, but I think it says greater than 28 nations, and it's actually higher than that. So the, I looked at these flags today to kind of familiarize myself with this deck a little bit more, and I just noticed one missing um, is that we are actually have a team right now doing a site setup in Brunei the kingdom of Brunei. So that's not on there. And we are negotiating with international customers all the time and also doing foreign military sales via the US government to nations across the world. So that 28 number, which is what I think it says over there, um, is, is, is greater than that number and changing all the time. We have two programs of record with the US Department of Defense, uh, RQ-21A Blackjack with the US Marine Corps and MQ-27B Scan Eagle, as well as the Blackjack, Blackjack with the US Navy. And you can see on the bottom right of the screen, all of the US government customers that we serve. Next slide. So this is interesting slide. Um, a lot of people don't realize that we, uh, we also operate off of ships. And so um, if you guys aren't familiar yet, which you probably are about our launch and recovery is not runway dependent, so we are runway independent. So we can operate on and off ships. It, it has some particular challenges, but this, uh, any ship, any ocean, any mission, I like this slide. So we have 8,000 sorties so far above ship, and you can see the different types of ships, and there's some flags associated with the nations that we're serving on ships today. Next slide. So just to sum up, 
our family of systems, our runway independent family of systems is bringing flexibility to our customers. So both land and maritime based operations. And we also are looking for this common architecture and modularity to support our capabilities going forward. So when I think of our family of systems and how it's evolved and continues to evolve, I think of partners like UND um, and that picture with the moss and the five air vehicles underneath the moss and how UND can partner with us as we go forward and continue down the path of common architecture and modularity to make sure that we have engineers, maintenance technicians, operators ready to serve our missions. And with that, I believe I am passing off to Ty. Yep, that's me. So I'll go over the, uh, our family of systems, the unmanned air vehicles, and um, I think the uh, launch recovery equipment here. So um, we can dive right into it with the next slide, Jim. So here you'll see our, our four platforms, the Scan Eagle, the Scan Eagle 3, um, the Integrator, and the Integrator ER. Um, we'll go over each one of these um, independently, but uh, it should just be known that you know they all use a, a common um, launch recovery system, as well as uh, a common uh, software operating system as well. So let's go to the next slide. So we'll start out with the Scan Eagle, and this has the the lion's share of the 1.3 million hours that that Ali was talking about. This is. Um, really the platform that pays all our bills and uh, allows us to, to innovate for everything else. Um, so as you can see, runway independent, uh, Jim will have a video here in a few minutes with the, the launch and recovery. If you haven't seen it already, it's still my favorite part. I've been with the company for 11 years and I was just excited, just as excited today watching three launches and three recoveries as I was my first day. Like it's still so cool. Um, as far as performance goes, it flies a lot like a J3 Cub or a Piper Cub, uh, except for the endurance. We get a lot more endurance. Uh, we launch off the, uh, off the catapult at about 60 knots. We fly around at about 70 knots and we come back in and we land at about 50 or 60 knots. Um, the endurance, 12 to 18 hours, um, that can be more or that can be less de depending on a lot of uh, different, uh, different factors. When I started flying the Scan Eagle in 2009, um, the missions I was flying in Iraq, our takeoff weights were somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 to 15 kilos. And now uh, it's not uncommon to fly a 25 plus kilo Scan Eagle on the same wings and the same fuselage. Um, so it's, it's really evolved into a really cool product. Uh, go ahead and uh, next slide. Uh, the latest addition to the family is the Scan Eagle 3. And this is what I've been involved with the most lately. Um, it has uh, about a 15 hour endurance. Uh, same thing about, uh, I think we advertise 19,000 feet. It has the same, um, a lot of the same commonality with the Scan Eagle um, as far as the fuselage goes, it carries the same payloads, but it flies uh, slower. It's a much more efficient airframe. If you look at it, it looks a lot more like a glider. And using the same engine as a Scan Eagle, uh, it's, it's heavier, but even though we have the same engine, it has greater endurance and it carries more payload. So that speaks a lot to our, our engineering team and the, uh, the aero team. Um, and what it can do is it can carry a lot more payloads, um, multiple payloads with the newer engine. What we were running into with the legacy Scan Eagle engines were not, they were not able to provide enough electricity to run the bigger payloads. So uh, Scan Eagle 3 really solved that. Uh, it's also built to be ITAR free, uh, which uh, makes it a lot more um, viable on the commercial market. And we're also going through the FAA certification process with it. And that's what, uh, that's what we're working on currently. Next slide. So if you think of the Scan Eagle as like a Corvette, you know, it's, um, it's very, has one mission, flies around, points a camera at things. Uh, the integrator and the, uh, the RQ, they're more like a pickup truck. Uh, there's a lot more space built into them. You can, um, you can load them up with, with different payloads. Um, the entire belly of the aircraft drops out and it's just a big open cavernous bay with a couple of um, power uh, ports in there. So you can build and integrate uh, your own uh, payloads into the integrator. 
Uh, it has a lot more endurance, 24 hours, um, 24 hours plus, depending on, on the configuration. Um, but you can see it's a lot heavier. It has, uh, um, it has another six feet of wingspan, um, but it, it does have that greater endurance. Next, uh, next slide. So even as an operator, if I look at the RQ21A and the integrator, you really can't tell them apart by looking at them. One's a program of record, one's not. A lot of it is software differences. One is, um, you know, built uh, to a specific standard for, for the military. Um, a lot of different encryption and things like that. So this is, uh, this one has, um, it deploys with, the, uh, the U.S. Marine Corps off of ships, and then once they go ashore, they take it with them and they fly it offshore. So it's um, they're able to take it with them everywhere, and it, it works really well for the Marine Corps. Next slide. And uh, kind of being um, uh, worked out alongside with the Scanning Eagle Three, uh, this is our other big project we have going on is the, the integrator extended range. So all of our entire family of systems rely on uh, line of sight. Uh, it's just a, a radio antenna on a, uh, on a dish and we can't fly behind mountains uh, and we can't be on, go beyond the curvature of the earth. So we're, we're limited in range to about, um, about 70 miles. With the integrator extended range, uh, as you can probably guess by the nose dome there, uh, it uses uh, satellites. So we're we'll able to fly hundreds of miles away and stay on, stay on station for, um, for hours and hours on end, up to 18 hours on station at 200 miles, 14 hours on station at 300 miles. Um, and we can do all that with, uh, with full motion video or um, any other signals intelligence payloads that the customers and, and, we, and we develop together. And again, uh, it still recovers, launches and recovers the same way as uh, the rest of our family of systems. Uh, next slide. And here, I think, uh, is this the video here, Jim? I'm going to try the audio here, hopefully. All right. So here we just see um, a few of our different platforms in, in flight. So I have to talk about that video real quick. Um, we shot that a few weeks ago out in uh, Eastern Oregon. You can go to the next slide, Jim. And uh, we brought in uh, kind of like a Hollywood uh, uh, film crew to, to shoot that. And they brought in a helicopter pilot that worked on, um, he just finished shooting Top Gun, a couple year, the new Top Gun a couple years ago. And his, uh, his resume is like off the chart. Any major Paramount picture that in the last, I don't know how many years, like he's been on it and, uh, flying the, the A-star helicopter. Uh, he was amazing with some of the scanning Eagle three footage. He was, I mean, I've done some formation flying, but nothing that even remotely compares to what this guy was doing. So it was really cool. Um, we'll go, uh, talk about the, the, uh, launch recovery equipment here. You can go to the next slide, Jim. So launch recovery equipment, uh, this is really what sets us apart uh, from the rest of uh, the UAS industry. We, um, there's lots of companies out there that have UAVs similar in size to us um, with, you know, maybe a similar camera. 
but none of them launch or recover the way we do. And because of that, they take up a lot more space and they have to use a runway. They're restricted to land operations, but the launcher and the skyhook really set us apart. Um, the launcher is trailer mounted. Um, you can just tow it with a, with a pickup truck, but it has its own onboard generator and uh, uses compressed air to launch the aircraft. Uh, the skyhook is, it doesn't have a net. That's another thing that some of the other companies went to was a net, but especially for the shipboard operations that required you, that required you to fly the aircraft at the ship where the net was set up. Um, we hang the, the skyhook off the back of the ship so we never bring any energy towards the boat. It's always like flown off the corner of the ship, making uh, launches and recoveries a lot more safer. Um, the Skyhook can be rotated, you know, any, any direction uh, in a small, small area. Um, for uh, a recent uh, demonstration we did, we, we set up everything in a 200 foot by 200 foot area. And we had a lot of room, like we even parked all the cars and everything in there. So even that was a lot of, a lot of extra room. Uh, next slide. Um, the ground control station. So this is kind of a funny slide because uh, we don't really normally set this up outside. Um, but uh, for this, uh, you get a good idea of what it looks like. And this is the RQ-21 um, ground control station. And the uh, this is right outside of our main headquarters, right on the Columbia River. So you can kind of see the view there. Um, but it's basically two computers. Uh, one that handles all the video and one that handles all of the uh, actual flying of the aircraft. There's common components across all systems. So uh, everything from uh, ScanAngle 3, Integrator, RQ-21, and uh, Integrator ER, they all fly off of this, this common GCS. And um, very shortly, the ScanEagle will as well. So it's... Um, it's totally scalable to allow for customization of personal space by end users. So you can, you can imagine where we can put this, uh, the, that computer stack and the monitors, just a little corner on the, um, in the command room on a, on a Navy ship, or I've flown from everything inside, everything from a, a uh, just a, a plywood shack to a, con a Connex container to um, an office building to the back of like a U-Haul van. Like I've flown from all those places and it, it, anywhere you can stuff this, uh, the ground control station we can operate from. Next slide. Uh, payloads. So we, there's, I mean, dozens of combinations of payloads and aircraft and everything like that. We work with some really unique suppliers here in our local area for, uh, for the payloads. We have, uh, day and night full motion uh, video, telescopic full motion video with continue, for continuous zoom. That's our, our EO900 camera that we fly on the, on the Scan Eagle. Uh, you can see that big ball turret there uh, on the uh, RQ21 on the bottom picture there. That one's just incredible. I've got to work with that the last few, uh, few months. Uh, one of my favorite ones that you'll notice on the right-hand column is VIDAR and AIS. And the VIDAR is kind of like radar is radio detection and ranging. VIDAR is uh, video detection and ra ranging. So there's a really high megapixel DSLR camera that hangs underneath the scan eagle and you program it to take say four or five pictures and in a sweep across in front of the scan eagle. And then it runs onboard software to find anything that's not water. So you find everything from life jackets to buoys to seagulls to people floating in the water or um, lost objects. And it just gives you a little thumbnail and you double click on that thumbnail and it'll point the, the, uh, the big camera, the, uh, the full motion video camera on the front of the scan eagle to that exact spot. And it makes finding things lost at sea. It takes hours off of what, you know, we can do it in minutes what used to take hours. Um, high accuracy photogrammetry for, for mapping and things like that. Um, all this stuff, it's anything you can imagine with, with UAS, uh, you know, we have, we've worked on it or we have experience with working on it. Uh, in all the years I've been working here, it's, it, I've been very fortunate to work on some of the, some of the coolest stuff. Um, cool, and we'll go to, yeah, go ahead and play the video. Kind of the evolution of, uh, of what's happened with our video. Um, 
when I got to Iraq in 2009, you can see the top center um, video there. That's, that's what it was like. And, and now even night looks like day with uh, the quality of the, uh, of the night imaging. So as a, as a UAS company, a lot of effort and uh, a lot of focus is put on the aviation side of things. But really what we are is an information company. Customers don't really care. In the end, they don't really care what the UAV looks like. But the video and the product that we provide is really what sets us apart from our, from our competition. And that, that product is always evolving. All right, next slide. So the software that we use to control the aircraft and provide the video um, as far as the RQ-21 and the integrator and the Scan Eagle 3 goes, we fly those on ICOM C2. Um, and there is a, a commercial variant of that called Inexa. And UND actually has that and they use it in some of their curriculum. You can build a plug-in for it and, and, fly, and fly your quadcopters with it. Really a, really a neat product. Um, easy to use interface. Uh, when I started flying Scan Eagle in 2009, there was a lot of ones and zeros, you know, typing them into little boxes to make things work. And now uh, with any, you know, aviation experience, you'd, you'd feel really at home operating ICOM C2. It has a, uh, the, the airspeed tape and the altitude tape, just like, uh, just like on a G1000. So it's, it's really, uh, really intuitive. Um, NATO, SANAG, compliant, that's, that's all for uh, some of our uh, international military customers. Uh, extensible open architecture design. Next. So the other thing that, uh, the other issue you run into is, you know, we can, can we consume all this data. We, um, we fly over a, a target and we, we take all this video and then what do you do with it? When I was flying a, uh, when I was flying on the wildfires uh, a couple of years ago, the flying the Scan Eagle was the easiest part, even at night in zero visibility, in really bad smoke with the updrafts and everything, the flying was the easiest part, but gathering all the data and delivering it to the customer, that was hard. Um, but we have a couple different products with uh, tacit view and then Catalina is the, uh, is the kind of the processing brains server that we use. Um, using that, we can, we can tag things live and go back and look for them later. Um, and that makes, uh, creating things like um, the GIS specialist, the uh, is it geospatial information specialist? What is GIS? Do you remember that, Jim? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they. Um, so we're delivering, you know, uh, latitudes and longitudes to them all night long, and they're creating maps. Uh, but they're using our software to do it, and it was is really neat to see. Um, this was uh, really built the last few years and it's really, uh, it's, it's getting better all the time, updated all the time. And I think, uh, Paul, we, um, we've sent people to UND to, uh, I think you guys have some uh, tacit view and Catalina licenses. You guys use it as well? Yeah, we do have it. We haven't used it very much, but now that we're flying the Scan Eagle on a regular basis, we're excited to get back into that again. Good. All right, next. So another thing that's, um, it's really difficult for companies um, as they grow uh, to either provide services or to innovate. And it's really hard to do both, but in situ is kind of, uh, they've kind of perfected both. We, you know, the uh, services provides, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of our bread and butter. That's how we, we make our money, but it also funds our ability to, to do research and development, testing, training, and working in flight test right now. Even today, I was out flight testing um, the, the next release of software that, uh, that's coming out to fly Scan Eagle. So that's, that's continuous. It never ends. Um, Moore's law never slows down. So things are always uh, evolving and uh, 
now as we start to implement the artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, this is really kind of the exciting next step uh, for in situ here. Ali, do you want to talk about services? Yeah, I think uh, I think I'm up here. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. And so I think we're actually going to touch on Nicholas's question. Uh, so we have two questions. So Wilmer, uh, we'll save that one until the end. Nicholas Brewer, I think that actually Jim is going to touch on this just a little bit. Our wildfire experience isn't that in this part of the deck, Jim? Yep, that's correct. And I can speak to the wildfire when we get there. So um, starting out, flight services. Um, this is, a, this is a, a major, major part of our company. Um, so as you can see, you know, it mentions operators and maintainers. There's also mission coordinators. There's site leads. There's so many different positions, so many uh, different groups of the crew of the team that's, that's out there at, at various sites um, around the country perform, uh, and around the world performing um, uh, di different jobs, um, supporting our services sites. So what that really means is that, you know, we, we train um, operators, maintainers, mission coordinators, we train them to go out into the field and they are, are flying our aircraft. We own all of the aircraft and they're supporting the customer's mission. mission. And so whether it's our, our military, uh, foreign military, um, we, have a, we have a job to do. And, and a lot of times that mission can, you know, it's life or death. Um, it could be monitoring a convoy. Um, you know, like Ty was saying, it could be searching for something in the ocean, um, drug running, um, forest fires, whatever it is. So it, it's a major part. And, um, you know, in my job being in aviation safety, you know, I get to obviously see some of the gruesome things when, when aircraft crash and get damaged. Um, but, uh, you know, you really start to appreciate, you know, the mission and, and that it's not just, you know, uh, an aircraft flying up, it, it's the entire operation. And so, um, you know, you can see some pretty impressive numbers there. Like Ali mentioned, the 1.3 million hours, uh, 60,000 in maritime um, so mission readiness is, is a major thing. We keep track of mission readiness rate. You know, that's an important statistic. Um, so like, you know, like I was saying, operators, maintainers, technicians, um, all certified, all trained at in situ, uh, 260 plus FSRs currently with this company, um, at 47, uh, global sites today. So that's a lot, a lot of, uh, FSRs, um, a lot of different operations going on at, all at once. Um, and so it's important to, to stay in touch, especially, you know, working in my job with aviation safety, uh, keeping in touch with uh, these folks out in the field, um, you know, maintaining those relationships um, and ensuring that, you know, they have a sound uh, safety culture at, out at their sites. Um, so backed up by global sustainment programs. So again, you know, it's, it's uh, not just the operation, it, it's a uh, a whole team of folks that help help support this operation um, from from uh, not just the folks out in the field, but uh, safety uh, standards um, uh, back home training uh, within the, everything within flight operations quality engineering um, you name it. So uh, full service models available for both uh, customer owned and in situ owned systems. So like I was saying. Um, you know, we, we own uh, some of the uh, systems where we uh, support uh, with services, but we also uh, sell, um, sell our product as well. Training. So I kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, so we have a very robust training program, uh, very experienced, knowledgeable instructors. Um, and, and you can see some, some other impressive numbers here, um, you know, customized training. Uh, curriculum up to 1,500 students a year. So, um, and that's students from all all uh, walks of life, uh, different different uh, uh, areas around the world. And so, uh, professional instructors, um, again, very very experienced, different experience. Um, some have uh, you know come out of, from the military um, or from the commercial world. Uh, former instructors, former pilots. Um, so that experience, uh, you know really is valuable um, when you're when we're training UAS operators and maintainers. 
And so, uh, you know, you can see more than uh, 8,573 operators trained globally, um, you know, across the world. So uh, realistic simulations, practical exercises, uh, some of the things mentioned here, um, you know, coming from UND, uh, scenario-based training was a big thing, um, you know, as, as a flight instructor um, and, and just really trying to, to make sure you put yourself in a scenario, especially an emergency scenario, um, to try to prepare yourself. And, you know, that, that's a big challenge in the UAS industry, especially um, for those operators going, you know, uh, across the ocean over to the Middle East, you know, and, and flying uh, some of these missions in these environments that, you know, really it, it's extremely tough to try to prepare yourself for something like that. And so, um, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of it's on the job experience, um, but, you know, coming from a manned aviation world, that, that really helps you uh, appreciate the aircraft, appreciate your surroundings, um, really, really uh, helps you with, uh, you know, internal situation awareness, external situation awareness. You know, obviously we're not on board our unmanned aircraft, right? So, um, you know, coming from that manned aviation world, you really kind of have that fear, if you will, you know, instilled in you. Um, and, and it really just heightens your senses and, and really makes you, you know, aware of, of everything, um, helps you with your scan. So uh, these are all things that are being considered uh, in, in our training department in our curriculum. So why in situ? Um, you know, I think about some of the things that are really important to me with this job and, and why I'm passionate about it. Um, you know, I, coming from aviation safety, um, you know, I'll just use an example. We have, if you have a, a scannable aircraft doing an orbit, you know, monitoring a convoy and all of a sudden the engine cuts. Well, it's not just the aircraft, it's not just the engine that, you know, you've lost, but you've also lost that mission. You know, your aircraft's gonna go down and all of a sudden you don't have eyes on your convoy. And so that's that's why, you know, I, I have passion for what I do in aviation safety is, you know, making sure that that does not happen ever, uh, keeping that mission alive. So, um, and, uh, you know, that, that's just, that's just one, one of my whys. So um, you can see here in situ's why with pioneering ingenuity. So uh, you can see here, you know, we're saying, you know, we want to continue to change the course of history and we have changed the course of history with Agile UAS capability. Um, so here's some examples of that on this timeline here. So you can see starting out in 1994, uh, where we found, uh, in situ was founded by engineers. Um, and then uh, moving on, we had uh, our first unmanned aircraft to uh, fly across, uh, uh, succeed in the transatlantic flight, um, operated with the US Marines, US Marines in uh, Iraq. Uh, you can see Captain Phillips here. Uh, I don't know if you guys seen that movie with Tom Hanks, uh, but there was a scanning on that. And so that um, uh, supported the, the Captain Phillips rescue. Um, and then going on from there, uh, first European customer uh, with Poland, first scanning on 2010. Uh, the FAA approved commercial BLOS flights. That, you know, I came on in 2012, so I remember that. That was a big deal. Um, you know, first BLOS in, in, the, in the NAS. Scan Eagle conducts uh, first BLOS under a civilian authority in Denmark. Uh, Blackjack, full rate production and deploys uh, in support of the 22nd Marine uh, Expeditionary Unit. And then 2017 Netherlands uh, MOD awards uh, short range tactical UAV con uh, contract for integrator, the Coast Guard Stratton. Um, so that, that was a, a really big deal. Um, you know, first cutter to deploy the, uh, the Scan Eagle. And we'll, we'll talk about that success story here in a second. Uh, 2018 SATCOM based extended range added to capability portfolio. So um, it's an awarded multi year contract uh, to provide the ISR services for the Coast Guard. And then here you can see 2019 again, you know, um, continuing to deploy Scan Eagle uh, across the fleet. And then uh, lastly, here in, in 2020, um, awarded uh, Group Three Program of the Year by the uh, DHS. And so, uh, you know, like Ty was uh, saying earlier, uh, wildfires is a big deal. It continues to be a big deal even this year. Um, and so, this was a, a really awesome success story. Um, in 2018, where we helped out with the Eagle Creek and uh, Garner Complex fires. And so, um, you know, like Ty was saying, uh, some big time challenges, you know, and, 
and it's uh, really helpful to the um, to the firefighters being able to fly at night and use that uh, infrared camera to identify the hotspots. And so, uh, Ty, I don't know if you uh, wanted to elaborate a little bit on this one. Yeah, there was a question um, from uh, Nicholas Brewer about uh, how we monitored the the um, the wildfires, and he asks a really good question because. Um, what a lot of people fail to, to realize any flight with the UAS, uh, in the, in the national airspace system is a big deal. Um, we were actually operating inside the TFRs. We had an agreement. Uh, we actually awarded a contract, um, a call when needed contract from the department of interior, and, uh, they helped to coordinate the airspace for us. We would operate inside the, uh, the TFRs that the, um, the tankers were using during the day, we would fly at night. Um, eventually we, uh, gained their trust enough that they let us fly during the day. So we would be operating up high and all of the tankers and helicopters would be operating below us. Um, so yeah, we were just operating inside of a TFR. Uh, they would, um, we could, we had say in how big and where we wanted the TFR. So if we, uh, if we couldn't find a, an appropriate uh, launch and recovery location, they would just move the, um, make the TFR a little bit bigger to accommodate us. So it, it actually worked really well. We flew, I think it was almost uh, 450 hours in August and September and October of 2018. So the Eagle Creek fire was actually the, the fall of 2017. And then the, the Garner complex was shortly after it. And then 2018, we flew on uh, some major wildfires in, in Southern Oregon. So uh, we had a lot of experience with that, but it was all flying at night uh, with a little bit of flying during the day. I just noticed there's a, a video here. I have to check this out. Yeah, so this is just some of the uh, conditions we were operating in uh, just up on top of these these mountaintops we just would set up the the launch and recovery equipment and it was very low visibility but uh, the scan eagle doesn't know the difference it just uh, just flies the GPS and recovers anyway and uh, another success story of regarding, uh, you know, our operations on the Coast Guard, combating the, the flow of illicit substances. So um, you can see here, um, you know, on the, on the top left, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a lot of drugs seized. Um, and that's just off, you know, one of the cutters and, and we're on quite a few. And so uh, it, it really is um, a major, major accomplishment and uh, being able to use the Scan Eagle and, and be able to, uh, fly those distances that the Coast Guard uh, weren't able to achieve um, uh, without, without the Scan Eagle. And so uh, you can see there at the, at the bottom, you know, Scan Eagles directly contributed to, to uh, seizing 4 point, more than 4.5 billion in illegal narcotics. Um, so two times that uh, from previous years. So it's a game changer. And uh, we're on more and more uh, Coast Guard cutters now. Uh, because of it. Um, Ty, Ali, do you guys have anything to add? Uh, um, no, if you just kind of keep an eye on our social media, it seems like every couple of weeks there's another giant bust. Video. Probably not fishing. Okay. So again, um, you know, it, it, it's a game changer. Uh, without a doubt, um, on our Coast Guard ships. So, and it's not just the Coast Guard fleet. We're on other um, uh, USNS uh, ships, like Ali was showing earlier. You know, various types of ships. Um, and so, uh, you know, safety is 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 a big big deal. And it's you know slightly, obviously, slightly different uh, environment than than some of our uh, than, than our land sites. 
um, you know, in, in a little bit different missions, obviously. Um, but, um, you know, again, it's, uh, uh, you know, super important to not only uh, for our aircraft, but our safety of our crew as well, operating on ships um, and understanding that, that environment. So building the future of unmanned aviation upon a foundation of unrivaled expertise. And so I think, you know, that's a good segue into, uh, you know, our uh, internship program and, and bringing on new, new folks, and new experience. Um, you know, we're not able to, to obviously continue to build without that. So um, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Allie. Okay, thanks, Jim, and thanks, Ty, for all that great information. I know there's a lot of questions in the Q&A window that I think Paul's going to moderate through those once we're done with this section of our presentation. So uh, we just kind of wanted to introduce um, just an overview of UAS career path, and then Jim and Ty are going to dive into a little bit of their own experience transitioning into a UAS career path. So, so you know, I have to say that I've been in unmanned aviation for a year and a half, but I've been in the aviation industry for over 20. And, and I have to say to everybody that's dialed in, we're, we're at 31 participants right now. Um, attending UND, you are at the right place to position yourself for a future career in, in unmanned aviation. So you've chosen wisely so far. So hopefully that's gonna go, go really well for you and continue to go well. So you need to get the experience. Um, exposure to other disciplines in unmanned aviation is especially important, I think, because it's still a growing, pivoting industry. Um, it's more in its infancy than commercial manned aviation engineering or operations jobs, from my experience. So exposure to other disciplines is really important in order to succeed. It doesn't have to be a full immersion, but I think the more exposure you can get to things like engineering, supply chain, quality, safety are going to help you um, as you pursue, pursue a career um, in the unmanned industry. So network, 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 conferences, prior graduates, et cetera. I mean, as you guys heard me when I introduced, I've known UND faculty since the early 2000s. And the network that I've created in aviation, even though I started in commercial aviation, is still there for me today. And that is how the aviation and aerospace industry is. So remember the important um, effort that you put in to networking is going to pay off in spades, in my opinion. We do have internships at in situ. Um, interns at in situ are fully immersed in projects that make a difference at in situ. Um, obviously this summer we had a little trouble because we were not operating on site. So we didn't employ as many interns as we would have liked, but I anticipate us going back to a full internship program next year. Um, you, you'll have a lot of exposure and direct mentorship if you team member. And then, a recommendation is also to be enrolled in an accredited college or university with a GPA of at least 3.0 for winter, summer, and fall terms. I'm not sure if that's a requirement or a recommendation. Jim, can you clarify that? Is that a requirement? Um, I believe that is a prerequisite. Okay, a requirement. So that's your goal. Yeah. Um, and good attitude and motivation. I, I think that what I've seen in the UND student population over many, many years is that there's a lot of discretionary effort in this student population. There's a lot of incredible attitude and great motivation. So I don't see that being a problem in this group that we're talking with today. Um, so that's just kind of an overview of career paths in unmanned aviation. Paul and I have talked at um, Hopefully we can do so even more as we go forward into 2021 about how we can get more UND um, exposure to our open positions uh, when we do post open positions that are not internship positions. So we'll continue to pursue that. Um, and at this time, I'm going to pass the um, mic back off to my colleagues who have some more um, very specific information about how they made the transition. Sure. So. Um... One moment, guys. Sorry, I think someone just knocked on the buttons. <laughs> that happens. I don't know if you guys noticed. I already had a photo bomb by one child. I don't know if anybody caught that. And one cat. I don't know if you guys caught that either. 
but I got I had a kid and a cat photobomb. That's the joys of uh, living at home, guys, and working at home. <laughs> so um, hopefully my dog doesn't start barking now. Um, so uh, in situ aviation safety. Um, so, you know, like I mentioned before, I'm, I'm in aviation safety is our, our team and uh, I'm a mishap investigator. And so uh, uh, just a little bit about my team. You know, we established a mishap prevention program in, in 2009. Um, really focused on mitigating risk of mishaps and increasing uh, our product reliability. And so since then, we've, we've evolved into a, a, a SMS-focused uh, program. And so uh, everything that we do um, falls, falls within the pillars of SMS. So hopefully those, you know, who are, uh, um, I don't know, Paul, if, if you're still teaching SMS, know about the pillars, pillars of SMS. So, um, you know, that's a big thing, and, and that's something that is uh, all the way up through Boeing. And so um, just some elements that, um, you know, uh, a part of our big program, mishap investigation is a big part. And then there's a, a overall higher level root cause analysis and, and corrective action and uh, methodology uh, that, we, that we perform uh, through various processes. And so um, that's, that's aviation safety, that's, that's our mishap investigators, uh, the engineers, the folks out in the field, um, all, all teaming up together to, 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 to perform this methodology to identify root cause, gathering evidence, formulating a, a root cause based on that evidence, and then trying to then identify corrective actions um, uh, that, are, that are effective, and then um, implement and monitor those corrective actions. So, you know, sort of a full circle um, methodology. So some other programs that we uh, uh, support uh, in our, in our, on our team, uh, hazard reporting. So identifying those near misses. Um, and so, um, you know, that's something that we keep metrics on, you know, how many hazards are coming in. Um, it also helps us understand, you know, what does our uh, culture look like um, with reporting hazards? You know, our, our folks out in the field, you know, do we have a culture where they feel like they can report um, without, you know, that fear of, of reprisal. And so uh, we, we have a, a very solid HAZREP uh, program at in situ. Um, so, so very proud uh, to have set that up. Mid-air mid collision avoidance, uh, bird aircraft strike hazards. So, um, you know, obviously mid-air is a, is a big deal. And, you know, talking about that, uh, you know, fear, if you will, uh, you know, that you have as a, as a man pilot, you know, very important as well to, to kind of maintain that awareness level, if you will, you know, the hairs on your on your arm sticking up when your aircraft's in the approach hold orbit, you know, over, a, you know, in a, in a saturated airspace waiting, waiting to come and recover on a skylight when you have other manned aircraft and assets landing on a runway nearby, you know, things like that, um, you know, you always have to take into account the mid-air collision reports. Um, and so we have uh, steps, programs, um, for, for notifying and reporting uh, near misses uh, like that. Bird aircraft strike hazards, you know, the BASH program, I don't know if you guys have heard of that. Um, it has happened. I have a photo of a bird um, that, that got hit by a scan eagle, believe it or not. Uh, that was probably, uh, you know, I don't know if there's something wrong with that bird, but the scan eagle you know, doesn't fly too, that fast. So, uh, but it has happened. And so, you know, those in North Dakota, you guys know, uh, you know, how many birds are flying around. And so uh, it's important to set up a bash program and, uh, you know, set up a logbook and record, uh, you know, bird sightings, um, you know, around your launch and recovery times. Uh, safety audits and, and self-assessment. So that's a big part of our team um, in our program. And so, uh, you know, we're required to perform um, uh, uh, semi-annual uh, safety self-assessments uh, by the government. Uh, we, we perform safety audits, spot inspections, um, just to make sure that, uh, you know, we're following our processes um, and, and uh, making sure, you know, all our safety mitigations are in place. Uh, human factors is a big, big part of our program, um, not just with, you know, mishap investigations, but also, you know, with our near misses and um, our, some of our proactive uh, uh, prevention uh, programs. And so uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of the uh, HFACS, uh, Human Factors Analysis and Classification System. So um, that's uh, set up by the DOD. Um, and we use that uh, to, to codify human factors uh, at, at all various levels of uh, the Swiss cheese model, if you will, 
reason Swiss cheese. And, um, and so we, uh, we have a record of all of the different human factors from near misses events, uh, mishap uh, events, um, all the way from, you know, the unsafe act all the way uh, up through the organization. And we then, you know, identify uh, uh, corrective actions to help uh, mitigate or eliminate those uh, risks of that human factor uh, happening again. Safety training and case studies. Um, so, you know, there's always lessons to be learned, um, you know, from the near misses and mishap events. And so uh, uh, we'll uh, create presentations, um, we'll, we'll submit those lessons learned and, and do case studies with our training department. Um, you know, we'll send out uh, newsletters uh, with, you know, success stories. Um, you know, we like to, uh, to recognize those that are uh, safe um, and, and make, you know, performing, uh, making the right decisions. You know, even if something bad does happen, um, you, know, there, you know, we still want to recognize those of, that have gone above and beyond uh, to try and, and make uh, the safest outcome possible. Safety review boards and stand-up meetings. And so, um, you know, starting from the folks out in the uh, field reporting an issue, um, we have these avenues where, you know, we can escalate risks. And so, um, you know, one example is I, I manage a, a safety stand-up meeting a few times a week um, in front of the executive leadership. And so that's a, that's a forum, you know, that, that Ali and, and others sit on and uh, we can listen to, uh, you know, not only the, the recent events that have happened, um, you know, we can status on some of our proactive uh, uh, programs, uh, safety programs, but we can also escalate risks and, and figure out, you know, if there's attention needed on a particular issue. And so that's just a, a high level of, of my team. Um, you know, the experience, um, you know, you guys know, I, I mentioned that, you know, former flight instructor coming from the man world, I had zero uh, UAS uh, background uh, coming into in situ, other than you know um, uh, what I learned uh, from UND uh, with the Scandigo program, and so you know that obviously was was very beneficial, and that's how I learned about in situ. Um, but again, you don't have to be a UAS operator; you don't have to have you know a lot of hours uh, to get on with in situ. Um, it, it really boils down to your drive and your motivation and how much you're willing to learn. Um, you know, and, and use your experience. I will say that the manned aviation experience was extremely beneficial. Um, you know, it really helped me uh, to, to kind of take the, the fundamentals that I've learned in manned, manned aviation and apply them to the unmanned side. Um, you know, there's a lot to, still a lot to be learned on the human factor side. Um, you know, a lot of times engineers will develop things, but, you know, a lot of engineers will haven't had that pilot background and so that's kind of where that uh, that man experience really comes in handy and so um you know like ali was saying having experience in all different uh different disciplines within aviation it, it really makes it beneficial uh working in an unmanned uh in the unmanned industry so um you know certainly open to uh, answering any more uh, questions about my team and uh what i do so with that i'll turn over to uh ty Thanks, Jim. Um, so I'll kind of go over the U.S. operator, what we look for uh, when we're hiring, uh, what I had when I got hired. Um, 2009 was a little bit different time for us. We had just uh, got awarded a kind of the contract that, that made the company, and we were hiring a lot of operators to fulfill um, requirements for, for more operators overseas. Uh, so when I got hired, I had a... Um, I had my private pilot certificate and the ink was still wet on my instrument, uh, instrument rating. So, but I was in the Navy and I had a security clearance and that was, I think of all that, I think the security clearance was probably viewed as the most, um, most valuable. Um, but as far as being a U.S. operator stateside, uh, as you probably all already know, part 107 operator certificate, if you have your private pilot certificate, it's, Literally, you know, you just fill out the IACRA, have a CFI, sign it off, and, and you're good to go. Um, but the things that can really set you apart, um, not just for in situ, but I think applying at any um, UAS operator department, um, any FAA man certificates, whether it's, I mean, even a sport pilot certificate, um, they, you know, people like to see that you've met a standard, uh, you understand airspace. Uh, you can talk on the radio. That's a huge part is just being able to talk on the radio. 
uh, confidently to other traffic or, or to an air traffic controller. Um, and these differentiators I've listen, listed, they're in no particular order, just as I kind of thought of them. Um, the security clearance was a big one. Obviously, that's a very hard, hard thing to get if you weren't in the military. But some companies pay for it um, if you have enough other skills that they see value in. Um, otherwise, I mean, even being in the in the National Guard or the um, in, or the Air Guard, it's pretty easy to get a security clearance. That being said, you know, behave yourself so you're eligible for a security clearance. Um, any le electromechanical skills, um, UAS are not, you know, from a mechanical standpoint, they're not hard to work on. Um, if you have a simple understanding of um, just basic electromechanical skills. In the Navy, I worked on uh, P3s and C-130s. So those are all 1950s, 1960s technology. Um, you know, power comes in, moves an actuator, and that actuator, you know, opens or closes a valve. That's really how landing gear work. Or that's really how, um, you know, how a servo works on a, uh, on a, on a scan eagle. So uh, understanding those things and being able to, to troubleshoot is a huge differentiator. Um, strong photography and camera understanding. Um, my, uh, I was lucky enough, my mom is a full-time photographer and has been my entire life. So I grew up around the words like exposure and brightness and focal length. And, you know, I had a pretty good understanding of those words and um, study that stuff and really understand what um, to provide the products that, uh, that the customers need. Uh, networking and IT skills. So networking, you know, Ali talked about networking with other people and how important that is to, uh, to grow your career, but like computer networking and IT skills, this was my weakest uh, area when I got hired. But uh, now, you know, the only quest, the only technical question they asked me on my interview was, could I find the IP address on my laptop? And I could do that, but, um, you know, know about multicast video and how to, how to send video across a network or network two computers together. You know, that's, that's a huge skill to have. Um, as with ScanEagle 3, you know, we're working on FAA certification, uh, it's very likely that the FAA is going to say that you have to be an AMP to work on it. So any sort of um, AMP background would be really good. A degree in UAS operations, just like you're you're working on at UND uh, or that's available at UND. You know, 11 years ago when I started uh, at in situ, that just wasn't a thing. Nobody really went to school for UAS yet, um, but it was it was growing and it was on the horizon. Now. Um, we had, uh, when I was on the commercial team, we hired two people that were like fresh out of college with a degree in UAS operations. So that was, um, so that's definitely a differentiator. Um, a deep understanding of the NAS, uh, how, how airspace works, um, cloud clearances, simple stuff like that. Um, you can see the map I have there. I just pulled that off of four flight this morning. That's the, the TFRs in uh, Northern California for the fires there. Um, understanding where to find, you know, where, where do I find the information on that TFR? Who do I get in contact with if I wanna operate there? Um, things like that. Uh, work with COAs and waivers. There's a, a UND grad, uh, uh, Jakey, was it Jakey Stoltz, is that right, Paul? Yep. Yeah, he's, he's amazing. He, he publishes a, like a monthly overview of all the all the waivers that were issued that month by the FAA, and uh, he really tracks you know the way things are trending and what waivers people are going after, who's getting them, because it's all public knowledge. So um, understanding how to get a waiver, uh, how to file for a COA, uh, anything like that is is really good. Um, and the last two are kind of uh, a really a bonus there if you have clean driving record and a commercial driver's license. Um, I had to get my, my CDL with my class B CDL with air brakes to operate our big trucks that we would drive to the fires. Um, you know, even though, you know, a scan Eagle fits in inside a little box, you know, we have a lot of, um, we bring a lot of stuff with us, spare parts for the launcher and the spare parts for the sky hook. And, you know, the trucks are big and they have big generators because we have, um, you know, we, we run the ground control stations inside of them. 
So just any, anything that can set you apart from being just a pilot is going to, is going to really help because, you know, as a scan Eagle instructor, I'm confident that anybody that was smart enough to open up zoom and log into this meeting, I could probably teach you to fly scan Eagle. So, um, it's the other stuff that's really going to set you apart. I think we have some questions, Paul. Yeah, thank you. This has been fantastic. And we do have quite a few questions. I'm going to let you, if you'd like to, uh, I, could, I guess I can read them out here. We have um, quite a few of them. Um, let's start with uh, one from anonymous attendee. It says, it asked about, and since you looked at the VTOL equipment for Scan Eagle. We have. So that's, um, you know, that's kind of the next big step, right? And that would eliminate the skyhook and the launcher. But any, anything we add to Scan Eagle comes at, a, comes at a cost. And that cost is endurance and, you know, all the other performance factors. So that actually ties in great with another question that I saw there that uh, asked about our flares system. Um, which was our flying launch and recovery uh, system, which uh, we're still uh, we're still working on. Um, it's still a thing. It's still uh, a product that's available to to Scan Eagle customers. Um, it's it's slowed down a little bit the last couple of years, but uh, we are working on um, on on flares as well as other uh, VTOL uh, solutions. Can you just say real quick what a, the flare system is? Right. So it's a I guess it's an octocopter. There's eight, um, eight blades on it. And it's, it's about as big as a kitchen table and it sits down on top of a scan Eagle and the scan Eagle latches underneath it. And, um, it then lifts it up to, uh, to a certain altitude and then it'll do a, a dash and the scan Eagle will drop away and fly away. Um, and we know the scan Eagle can fly for, you know, 16, 18 hours, come back. And that, that flares has since, uh, you know, landed, recharged, and they have a rope attached to the bottom and it pulls that rope tight and the scan eagle uh, flies into the rope just like it does on the sky hook. And then it's lowered down to the operators and everything lands. So it uh, negates the requirement for a, a, la a launch during a sky hook. It's quite innovative. Yeah, I'll just add really quickly that it is clear to us from our customers and at in situ, our we we kind of base our corporate priorities on this inverted pyramid, and the customers are at the top of that. And it's clear to us from our customers that they want a VTOL capability, and so Flares is still being uh, assessed with research and development dollars. And there's other uh, research going into how we resolve VTOL in the best way for our customers. Their needs come first, and what works best on our equipment. And, and flares isn't uh, it's not an in situ product. It's a, a supplier that that's developing it, that we're working, we're working with them. Yeah. Uh, so she's right. Yeah. It's, it's being assessed. Um, there's at the rate things are, are progressing in the VTOL world. Uh, there's really no telling which way things will go right now. Question uh, from another anonymous person. Is there a specific time frame when applying for, or when applications come out, for these internship opportunities? When, when should they start looking for things uh, on an internship level? It's usually in the spring, isn't it, Jim? Because I think we had advertised all of our internships right when the pandemic started and got a lot of fantastic applicants and then kind of had to roll back a little bit because we knew we weren't going to be on site. Is that right? Yeah, and you know, from, from past experience too, um, I, I don't know if there's an exact time, um, but I, I know that um, uh, typically universities um, and certainly University of North Dakota would have a heads up as to when interns, internships would be posted. And uh, from my experience, and this is going back to 2012, I think there was something on the order of like 30 different internships. Uh, th there was, a, there was a dozens of them that, that were uh, available. And um, don't apply to just one, apply to all of them if you can, because, um, you know, resumes could get, get passed around or if, or if one internships, you know, taken, you know, certainly there could be another one. And at least, you know, you're able to, to, um, you know, get, get involved in the company. Um, and so um, I don't know if there's a specific set time, um, 
I think Jenny said this morning uh, or yesterday in our meeting that um, I don't think we're just tied to summer internships either. Right. Yep. And also we have a, a UAS operations uh, blackboard site for the students and I can be coordinating with uh, Sitsu as well as opportunities come up. I can post that on there. And if you're in a UAS class, you should get that notice. Just looking at the announcements is where I put that. So I'll be you know, sending out announcements when opportunities like that arise. So I'll make sure I follow up on that. Looks like we have a few uh, guests from across the, the globe, probably in our master's program, possibly. I see one from Malaysia and another one, I think from Columbia, I think it said. Um, what would be a good email address where somebody, if they had some specific questions, looks like they're kind of operators looking for more detail that they could you know, contact the company. What would be a good email for them? Yeah, I saw those questions, the one from somebody from Colombia and the Malaysian one. So I, I'll i take them and just make sure we get an answer, Paul. So do you want me to type my email address in the chat window or do you want to circulate it to you those know what? I can, that We could give on. my email address on there and then if they want to email me that question, I can forward that on to you. Would okay, that be, yeah, that be okay? So let yep, me just... Because probably answer. need a little bit more. Yeah, I need a little more information, I think, on a couple of these, especially this one from the anonymous attendee, Scan Eagle Pilot in Columbia, just to understand exactly the situation before I can get a good answer. Exactly. So just uh, the email address is paul.snyder, so P-A-U-L dot S-N-Y-D-E-R at U-N-D dot E-D-U. So feel free to email me and I'll, I'll definitely get uh, that forwarded on with once you give me more specific information. Um, how about the smoke conditions of the wildfires? How did they negatively affect the UAS or did they in any way? Um, I would say the biggest way that they affected the UAS was that I can still tell the scan eagles that flew on the fire because they still smell like smoke. <laughs> Other than that, um, there really, really weren't any negative effects. You know, we, we fly by GPS. So when I'm sitting and operating the, the scan eagle and I'm moving it across a map, the outside visibility is kind of irrelevant. Um, we did worry about uh, the uh, the air filters, you know, on the air intakes for the going in, the, in through the carb, um, but we never really found, you know, any, you know, ash or debris or anything in there. Uh, the aircraft would, you know, they would come back with ash, you know, in in them a little bit, but it was very easy to clean. Um, yeah, really no, no negative effects, no, um, you know, flying over the fires, you get some big thermals coming off the fire. So it might be a little bit turbulent, but uh, when you're operating the camera, the way that the camera gimbals work, that you really, you can't tell by looking at the video that you're in turbulence. Um, it's not until you, you know, zoom way out and look at your wing that you see it bouncing on the horizon that you can tell that it's turbulent. Okay, um, and last question here, um, kind of a combination question. Um, are there opportunities to work uh, not to be a deployed overseas? And then for those that are deployed, what does that look like? Is it a you know three to six months on and then off, or what's that look like? Uh, yeah, that's deployed? a pretty yeah, that's a pretty common um, structure for the deployed people. Um, it kind of depends on the needs of the contract. You know, I did six months on, six months off, six months on, and then got a full time job. You know, in the you know, at the home base here. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, I think they even do four month deployments. Um, I think they try to give you as much time off as you do when you're deployed. Allie might be able to answer that, um, the deployment side of it. Yep, I, I would agree. So I think opportunities in flight or op operations at in situ, um, there's, there's, job opportunities where you do not have to deploy such as as a mishap investigator but if you want to be an fsr so an operator then all of those right now are deployments so then you would have to go through the process of deploying and tyler's correct we normally target a four to six month deployment depending on the actual assignment they actually they vary in terms of complexity in terms of visa requirements so they do vary so we, we target a four to six month deployment and then equal time off when you return to the, to the States, to your home of record. Um, so I hope that answers your question. And then, um, you know, we're, you know, I think I forget we're 12 or 
1500 employees right now. Um, but we have everybody in finance. We have people, we have engineers, electrical engineers, software engineers, mechanical engineers, aero engineers. Um, there are countless opportunities beyond just being an operator. Fantastic. Well, I think we answered most of the questions and we are so thankful that you took the time here uh, to meet with us, uh, Jim and Tyler and Allie. Thank you so much for, for coming and presenting today. Hey, Paul, I, are there, is there a way for you to um, take a screenshot of the questions so we can make sure we answered them all and get answers out there if we need to? Uh, definitely. I think that's all captured. We should be okay. able to get that. Yeah, sure I, I, I see the, yep, just, just to make sure, or just make sure that they, they ask you, um, you know, email you directly, just to make sure we get everything answered. Yeah, if you don't feel like you got your question answered directly or well enough, please, again, my, my email is paul.snyder at und.edu, and I'll definitely field that question and answer it. Or if I don't know it, I'll work with um, Insitsu to get the answer back to you. Give me a few days and we'll get back to you. So again, thank you everybody for attending. We're, we're again, especially for Boeing Institute for taking the time to do this. We really appreciate it. We're so thankful for the relationship that we have with you. All right, goodbye. Thanks thank guys. You. Thanks for hosting. Thanks everybody. Take care. Yep. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.